Lassa and uh, Dr. Ali Miran, who is an even younger cardiologist in our institution. He will present the case and discuss it. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I will present a case of an oncological patient with chest pain. It's a 70-year-old man, which uh, he was rushed to the emergency room with uh, chest pain and signs of pulmonary congestion. His uh, past history is relevant for uh, uh, non-ST elevation. In my 2005, he underwent coronary angiography, which showed triple vessel disease. And uh, on the same admission, he underwent coronary bypass surgery, uh, including a graft of Lima to left anterior descending artery, a saphenous vein graft to the obtuse marginal, and another saphenous vein graft to the posterior descending artery. 2011, he was uh, hospitalized for urinary obstruction and hematuria. He was diagnosed with benign prostatic hyperplasia and was uh, pretty much lost to follow up. Between the years 2016 and 17, this year, he had uh, an unintentional weight loss of 40 kilograms. Um, unfortunately, he didn't go for any checkups for this. 2016, he developed uh, normal cystic anemia, hemoglobin around 10 grams per deciliter, and again, no prior, no other um, diagnosis, no other workup was done. His risk factors are heavy smoking, diabetes type 2, and hypertension. On 2017, he was hospitalized in the internal medicine department for severe back pain and constipation. Total body CT showed diffused lymphadenopathy, lung nodules, osculosclerotic lesions, and the liver lesion. His PSA was above 3,000. Uh, and of course, he underwent a prostatic uh, biopsy, which showed the denocarcinoma Gleason score of eight. This is his regular medication. His current hospitalization, as I said, he was uh, admitted to the ER with shortness of breath and chest pain. On examination, he appeared pale, dyspneic, tachypneic. His pulse was 120 beats per minute. His blood pressure was 140 over 60 millimeter mercury. And he had a saturation of 88% on room air. His ECG showed ST depression on the lateral wall. And his lab was positive for elevated troponin levels, CPK, and a low platelet count. This is an example for, for, uh, from his ECG, which shows ST depression, V5, V6, good sensitive lateral wall. Um, during his admission, an, echo scan, an echocardiographic exam was done, which showed moderate LV dysfunction and moderate MR. I would like to pause now and ask the audience um, whether or not to proceed to CAS or coronary angiography, invasive procedure? Well, we need two variables. One would say yes, one would say no, and then explain why. Danny? You want to post, huh? What would you do? What kind of treatment do you see for the post? Excellent. Uh, good, good question, sorry. Uh, Previous. He, of course, he received dual antiplatelet therapy. Dual antiplatelet therapy and for, oh, for the prostate. No, no, we're not there. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. We're not there. No treatment. No, no, he was diagnosed. No treatment. So it's one of the typical patients that comes in with, you know, almost complete workup, and he has the tumor. We don't know the treatment yet, and he's coming to the cardiology department in pulmonary edema, and the question is what to do. So we started initial management, but the question is, should we be aggressive and take him to the cath lab, like we would have done with the regular patient that comes in with uh, pulmonary edema and ST depression and chest pain, or due to the fact that this is a patient with generalized metastasis and not treated, and we don't know what's going to be the treatment, 
should we be on the conservative part? Sorry? Why do we have to choose? Well, you know, if we're starting to go with a catheterization, we oblige ourselves, as we'll show later, to maybe intervention. Maybe some of the intervention are going to influence the treatment that he's getting. By the same time, we delay the treatment for his main disease. So the question should we be aggressive or should we just give him regular treatment and start with his chemotherapy and be a little bit more? Because the situation is not coming with the STEMI, with acute myocardial infarction, which in this case we won't have any question, we'll take him to the cat. Is The question is, what's the best treatment? <laughs> That's exactly the question. And the question for us as cardiologists that saw him in the morning, how aggressive should we be? Because, you know, we can be very aggressive, go to the cath lab, try to open all the arteries, send him to surgery, etc., etc. Definitely, we're going to delay the, the, the treatment that he might get for his cancer because he cannot get... Well, it, well, it's it's very difficult to do orchiectomy okay, and cabbage at the same time. I'm on the conservative side. I'm the enemy of the enemy. Okay, very good. So, so what would you recommend? Automatic pilot. Okay, so you as a conservative cardiologist believe that he should undergo interventional workup. Well, I definitely agree with you, and this is part of the discussion we had in the morning, and I wanted to bring the discussion that we had our, during our morning rounds and morning meeting, because usually, as I mentioned, if it would have been a regular patient, we'll take him to the cat lab. Here, you have some question which, first of all, we don't know what's the treatment, how urgent is the treatment, how dangerous is to give him antiplatelets, heparin, all those in the patient who has metastasis, maybe bone metastasis, maybe liver metastasis. So the combination of those problems in the morning is a problem, but as you mentioned, taking the situation that the patient came in the morning with uh, almost pulmonary edema and the diffuse changes in the ECG, we decided to go ahead and catheterize him, but I just want to mention that it's not like you said, automatic pilot, you have to be very careful and take all the pro and cons together and then tell the people that are going to do the catheterization that 
while they're doing the uh, an, uh, diagnostic angiogram, they should be careful about the second stage, how to approach and how invasive to be, because if you start treatment, anticoagulation treatment, it might be uh, very important for the future of the patient if it can undergo some other operations. So maybe let's continue with the patient. Uh, yeah, okay, as, uh, as we raised the debate, uh, the patient went to the cath lab 48 hours after his uh, admission. And on uh, coronary angiography, as we can see, the white arrow pointing towards the uh, area of the LA left anterior descending artery, his left main and circumflex arteries are all diseased and chronically occluded, of course. His right coronary artery was uh, also totally chronically occluded. His lima graft, left internal mammary to LAD graft, was patent and open with a nice flow, and as you can see on the bottom, a retrograde flow to the PDA artery. This is just a close-up of the same picture. His venous graft to the PDA was totally occluded, and he had another venous graft, as I mentioned before, to the obtuse marginal, which showed two critical narrowings towards approaching the anastomosis part. At this part, again, I will stop and ask maybe the audience, um, should we proceed to coronary intervention? Yes, why, why can? Okay, so, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, we wanted the oncologist to see that sometimes we have also dilemmas. <laughs> it's not that simple in cardiology. What I want you to, as an oncologist to know that we in cardiologists understand nothing about it. <laughs> so for us, prostate cancer and lung cancer is on, on bowel cancer is the same. We are dealing with a patient and you know with infused metastasis in the morning, and then what do we do? And some of my colleagues said, go and open it because this is the typical what we have a reflex that is called oculostenotic reflex. We saw it narrowing and we open it. Not always we are right. I agree with you. So let's play the game. And this is a lung cancer. Would you, would you because for us, the question is generic. <laughs> So, you must know that for all each metastatic metastasis where we see patients for the first time, the median survival would be, let's say, given by blood cancer, now it's 11 months, and lung cancer can be in a few years if you want to So, we have a long time. Now, another question is how far the grows, and I'm talking only about solid tumors, not about the ones. The W time is usually about three, four, six months. So, I suppose you can do that in three months or so. That's very good. So at least now we are relaxed <laughs> as cardiologists. The problem that we have, and maybe we should bring all the cardiologists to be more relaxed, because we feel that the patient needs urgent intervention I don't on the oncology part because he came with severe bone pain and everything so the feeling was and that he needs some uh, very quick answer and it can be some other things and now I'm going to the cardiology thing this lesion and again we, we if you we can go back uh, it's not a tight lesion which means it's supplying only a small part of the heart. It's not something which is going to determine his all, all prognosis. And I can tell you that probably if the patient would have been with hemoglobin of eight and with pain and anything, this would have been a small issue in him. The entire issue was due to his general condition, 
plus the ischemia. So the ischemia was on top of it, and I can assure you that if we would have treated all the other things related to this oncology, this is not a major issue. So the question for us was, and as we discussed previously, we told the uh, interventional cardiologist, don't rush, catheterize, and then let's think. Because is it a critical lesion? Is it something that is going to endanger the patient? Or is it some narrowing that maybe the patient is living with this lesion for quite a long time? Like you said, the doubling time, it's the occlusion time in our case. And because of his general condition, this became very prominent in this patient. So the answer whether to go ahead or not is not quite clear, but again, because we are cardiologists, you'll see what we decided to do. But what we wanted to aware ourselves is that we don't always have to open everything that is occluded, especially in such a case. And if you come to us and tell us, listen, in this patient, let's say it's diffused lymphoma or whatever, and Professor Ben Yehuda tells us that he needs urgent treatment, we can survive with such a lesion also. It's not a life-threatening lesion. So, and the, 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 the issue here is not whether I'm right or wrong. The issue here is just to bring the thing, the debates, issues that we have to consider before we're advancing with such cases. So I'm uh, sorry to disappoint you, but... Uh we decided, of course, to intervene. <laughs> um, and after inflating a balloon in that lesion, we put a stent, of course, and the end result was excellent, as are all our interventions. Not all. <laughs> Most. <laughs> Most. <laughs> uh, and surprisingly, 24 hours after the procedure, the patient developed massive hematuria, and the hemoglobin dropped to 7. And uh, now we're in a dilemma. So what do we do? Do we stop his dual antiplatelets? Do we reverse? Do we send them to an urgent urological intervention, which, of course, the urologist would love to do? Sorry? What was it? Where was the bleeding? Hematuria. The ble where did it originate from? Well, um, we didn't, uh, you know. Yeah. If it's hematuria, this is the... Most logical place, I guess, uh, for him to bleed up. Um, so again, we wanted to show you that things are not that easy because we are getting in those patients which we are doing the procedure very intense anticoagulation. In this patient, we had only clexan and dual antiplatelet, but very ag aggressive antiplatelet. In other, we have to give anticoagulants, which makes the equation even much more so problematic, and in some cases, when we put the drug eluting stents, uh, because of the drug eluting stents, we need to continue the treatment for a longer period of time. But since Professor Gilon is showing me the watch, we'll continue a little bit more quickly. So basically, uh, we didn't know what to do, like all of us. So we decided first to give him the blood. Due to the fact that we were already obliged with the stent, and we know that if we stop the, anti the antiplatelet therapy, the patient has a higher likelihood of stent thrombosis, we decided to continue. It was transferred to urology, which is good for us because we told them that we finished our treatment and he started this thing. And luckily enough for this patient, the patient actually uh, stopped bleeding and the the rest of the course was almost une un uneventful, <laughs> yes. We are at the eighth floor, they are at the third floor, so exactly. So the whole issue of this simple case was to show us that we face a lot of dilemmas, part of it because we do not know entirely all the entire uh, natural history of the disease, the treatment. So. This is a need for us, and that's what's happening in our hospital, where we are trying to work more and more closer with the oncologists because we see more and more cases on the one hand of cancer, 
we see more and more cases on the other hand of ischemic heart disease. So from our side, we have to take into consideration what are the treatment and especially the interventional treatment with ACS, PCI, dual antiplatelet, etc. And like you mentioned, we have to take also into consideration what is the disease, chemotherapy, and the prognosis and the differences between lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, and uh, prostate cancer. And at least I learned that even the aggressive uh, doubling time, we still have some time for the stents. So thank you for that. Thank you very much for all the speakers.